1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you have your Bibles. Many of you, if not all of you by now, have probably heard the name Zoe Grace. You see my smile, right? Zoe is our soon-to-be seven-month-old golden doodle. And on days where my workload or the family schedule is uh, 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 heavy and will have us away from the house more than just a few hours during the day, or if we're going places where we're not allowed to take her with us to avoid having her pinned up in her kennel all day, Zoe goes to doggy daycare. Yes, doggy daycare. I want you to know that Zoe loves doggy daycare. Like become another dog loves doggy daycare. I tried to get some video to show you guys just the difference between how she behaves at home, even getting out of the car, going up to the door. Once she's inside that place, all rules go out the window. She forgets herself. She loves doggy daycare and has from day one loved doggy daycare. So much so that after the first day, I had to start having conversations with Zoe before we got out of the car to go into doggy daycare. Maybe you've had a similar, situ a similar conversation. It goes something like this. Don't you get up in here and clown me. This is me talking to a puppy, right? Or maybe you've heard it like this. When we get up in here, you better act like you got some sense. You've heard that one? I know many of us have possibly heard these words or perhaps very similar words when we were children. For those of us who have children, you've probably spoken these words or similar words on multiple occasions. If your folks were going to the store and you were fortunate enough to get to come along with, you may have heard the following. Don't touch nothing. Don't ask for nothing. Because you ain't getting nothing. Anybody heard that? If you were going to someone's house, possibly even a relative, before you left the house and again, before you got out of the car, you may have heard the following conversation. You not hungry. You not thirsty. So don't ask for nothing. If somebody offer you something, you say, no, thank you. Don't be out here having people think I don't feed you. The reason for conversations like these is the fact that what you do or the idea that what you do and how you do it is not just a reflection of who you are, but a reflection of whose you are. We see something similar in our text this morning. The church at Corinth is a young church. And believers are still trying to figure out and trying to make sense of what their new life should look like. They don't yet have a grasp on what the distractions are and how to avoid them. And the fact that their life should be devoted to God and it should look like a life devoted to God. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 25, the word of the Lord reads, Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in the view of the present distress, it is good for a, for a person excuse me, to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. Now, we don't see anything just apparently extraordinary in this text. Paul is simply talking about life and how we might choose to engage in life with those around us. That engagement might come through marriage or it might come through singleness it may be through our mourning or our rejoicing it can even come through our buying and selling and enjoyment of goods or any of our other dealings with the world as Paul phrases it in verse 31 of our text 
But why does any of it matter? As Paul is writing, continuing to address the concerns of the church at Corinth, having no command from the Lord, what should we make of his counsel here? In my study, I've seen many use this text as an encouragement for the unmarried to remain single. And while it does certainly speak to that, I think if we leave it there, that we fail to see what Paul is really trying to drive home here. You see, for the believer, whether married or single, whether in mourning or rejoicing, in any of our dealings with the world, in whatever we do, we should do all for the glory of God. Amen? It's 1 Corinthians 10.31. As we look at our text this morning, I want us to do a self-check. Where do we stand? Where do we stand in Paul's aim here as stated in verse 35? I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. He's talking about distractions and devotion. Look again with me at verse 25. Although Paul has no command from the Lord, he feels burdened to give counsel. And I say burdened because of what we read in verse 26. I think that in view of the present distress. Scripture doesn't tell us what this present distress is, but scholars have speculated a number of things ranging from famine uh, uh, to the collision of gospel and the culture of Corinth. Perhaps even a, a, a deepened sense of urgency and in anticipation of the Lord's return based on the words that we see in verse 29 as he writes, the appointed time has grown short. And again in verse 31 as he writes, for the present form of this world is passing away. In either case, Paul is moved to give counsel concerning those who are betrothed or engaged to be married. And the counsel he gives is this. Verse 26, I think that in the view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. Paul says, look, family, now is not really the time to be making these kind of major changes in your life. His statement here is very much in line with what we see in verse 24, as he says, so brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Don't seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. Well, if it's not a sin, Paul, why shouldn't we marry? The latter part of verse 28 tells us, because those who marry will have worldly troubles. And he says, I will spare you that. What kind of trouble are we talking about, Paul? Verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. The trouble he's talking about here is distraction. Verse 34, and his interests are divided, and the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the, the excuse me, but the woman, ah, ah, ah. But the married woman, amen, is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. And as an unmarried brother and sister, we won't oversimplify, um, excuse me, um, although he's talking about distractions for married couples, we won't oversimplify distractions that we may have as singles as well, Amen. But Paul is making his case for singleness, so we'll continue to pick at the married folks. So what does Paul fix? For those who don't take his advice to stay single, those who marry and are not sinning and being married, how do they avoid the trouble and the anxieties? Look with me at verse 29. This is what I mean, brothers. 
The appointed time has grown short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with the world, for the present form of this world is passing away. Let those who had wives live as though they had none. Is Paul making a case to abandon Wives? Is that what we're reading here? Of course not. Of course not. Of course Paul isn't making a case to abandon wives because that would go contrary to everything that he's taught even here in 1 Corinthians or in Ephesians. But Paul is making a case for followers of Christ to live a married life as if Christ is preeminent, as if Christ is paramount, as if he is the head. God does take marriage seriously. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Peter 3 and 7 gives us a glimpse of just, a glimpse of just how seriously God takes marriage. Saying, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are the heir, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So he's not making a case to abandon. God takes marriage very seriously. More so, a devoted believer isn't less attentive to their spouse. A devoted believer is more attentive to their spouse, more loving, more patient, more kind. Why? Because they understand that through their devotion uh, 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 to God, that they see their spouse not just as a husband or a wife, but as a son or a daughter, someone made in the image and likeness of God, someone Christ loved enough to die for. Likewise, Paul isn't making a case to abandon mourning when life calls for us to mourn. On yesterday, my wife's family uh, laid to rest one of her first cousins. She passed, I think, on New Year's, on New Year's Day. Because of her condition, the condition she was born with, her parents were told that they should expect 12 years. And God gave this beautiful daughter 43 years. While we certainly, or while there were certainly tears on yesterday, Scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring him those, or God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. We know that there's life after death. So even in our mourning, we are to demonstrate that Christ is preeminent. He is greater than our grieving, and the reward that awaits us on the other side is greater than any rejoicing we might experience on this side of heaven. Likewise, in our buying and enjoyment of goods or any of our dealings in the world, Paul isn't making a case to abandon your home or to quit your job or to walk away from any and all relationships, but he is encouraging us to view them in light of our relationship with Christ. How consistently do we live like this? Remember, we're self-assessing. Is Christ preeminent in your marriage, in your singleness, in your work life, in your social life? Or are we guilty of allowing our obligations to rob us of opportunities to live a more devoted life? Verse 35, he says, I say this to your benefit. Not to lay any restraint upon you, to, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Paul says, I'm not looking to burden you with my burden. He says, it's for your good. This is how you avoid distractions because distractions are the enemy of devotion. And I want you to live the life God has called you in Christ, a devoted life. A few final thoughts on application. 
how we can move towards living a more devoted life. Number one, be honest about your distractions. And this can be a tough one for us because sometimes we don't even recognize that our distractions are distractions, right? A few years back, we went through uh, uh, a book in our missional community called 12 Ways That Your Phone Is Changing You. And I've had to go through that book even myself on several occasions because this phone is a distraction. I don't know if you guys remember a, a few weeks back, or it may have been a month or so back, where Facebook went down for a few hours. Even knowing Facebook was down, I found myself picking my phone up. Anybody else do that while it was down? Just me. I'm an addict. But it was a distraction, so we have to be honest about our distraction. Here's what John Piper says about distraction. God wants us to be delivered from the fragmenting effect of fruitless distraction. He wants us focused on what's most important. But it's very unlikely that we receive, that we will receive a quick fix because there is more going on in distraction than we often realize. In fact, we have, we have a lot to learn from all that is happening in us when we are tempted to be distract, distracted. Excuse me. First, distractions frequently tell us what we love and trust and fear. We hear that? We gravitate towards desires we crave and away from fears we wish to avoid. Listen to what your familiar habitual distractions are saying. In what are you seeking joy? In what are you seeking shelter? What are you trying to escape? Distractions also tell us where we formed poor habits earlier in life and that we've not adequately addressed yet. Some bad habits are due to growing up in broken family systems and some are indulgent habits we formed in youth or adolescence for which we must now be mature enough to take responsibility for. What are your distractions telling you? He ends this way. Record them as you notice them for two or three weeks. You will not fight them successfully until you know what's fueling them. Distractions fueled by different disordered loves, disordered loves, or fears or biology or plain, or plain old bad habits require different habitual battle strategies. So be honest about your distractions. Number two, train like you fight. Train like you fight. For those who don't know, I enjoy sport and defensive shooting. If you've ever been to a gun range, you go up and you have your station, a traditional gun range, and your station is stationary, and you have your target down range, and your target is stationary. The target doesn't shoot back, right? If you're ever in a situation where you have to use your firearm to defend your life, it's not likely that your enemy is going to be stationary and not attacking you. So if you choose to pose for your enemy, as you would at a traditional gun range, you put yourself in harm's way. So what does it mean to train like you fight? To train like you fight is to move your feet, to duck and cover. If somebody's attacking you, you're going to protect yourself, right? Do all that you can to avoid being hit and to take every opportunity to look for, uh, uh, to make every shot that you have to take count. So how does this apply to living a devoted life? Scripture tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Scripture also tells us that the thief, our enemy, only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We have a real enemy, an enemy who is not standing still. His press is constant and multifaceted. He will attack your mind. He will attack your emotions. He'll attack your body, your relationships, your finances. Anything that he can do to keep you distracted from living a devoted life, he will do. So train like you fight. That means prioritizing meaningful 
prayer. Meaningful prayer. That means prioritizing scripture reading and meditation. That means making this discipline or making this a discipline even when we don't feel like it. That means making this a discipline even uh, 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 when our schedule is busy or our body is tired. And lastly, embrace the community. Embrace the community. God didn't just reconcile us to himself. He reconciled us to each other. And the body of believers, your brothers and sisters in the faith, is a resource that many of us really just just underutilize, if I can say so. Because most of us choose to go through together. We don't want to be a burden to anyone. But that's what the body is for. That's what your brother and sister is for. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens his friend, or one man sharpens another. God has gifted you with a body of believers, built-in prayer partners, built-in accountability partners. But you got to be intentional about linking up. Amen. Amen. In our hope to live a more devoted life to Christ. And I I, I hope, I honestly hope, that as we do this self-assessment, because family, it's easy to drift. It's easy to drift. So I hope that as we're doing a self-assessment this morning, that we're doing an honest self-assessment, that we're looking at our distractions and we're looking for ways that the enemy has caused us to drift away from God and not be, not look to promote a proper order, as Paul says, verse 35, a proper order to secure devotion. If you don't write the ship, you can't help, you, you can't hope to, to live devoted. Amen you got to have everything in a proper order. Christ has to be preeminent in everything. I pray God's help for you. I pray God helps for myself. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you.